When gamblers or crooks fix a horse race or they do some inside trading on the stock market, they don't like to tell a lot of people for two obvious reasons. One, the more people you tell, the odds will drop and that means you make a lot less money. And But, but even the, the second reason, slightly longer term, is the more people you tell, if, you're, if people think every time they go to a racetrack, the race is fixed, or if you buy a share in a company, the price of that that stock is 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 being rigged by insider trading. Well, they're not going to want to play those games anymore. So you're going to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. But I guess those rules don't apply to our buddies in the press and their liberal enablers and, and, and cohorts. Because over the last month, we've had two examples where the fix was in. Everybody's talking about the same thing at the same time as if they flicked the switch. But nobody seems to care that, you know, everybody kind of notices it. I mean, the latest example is this immigration thing, right? I mean, if somebody flicked the switch, all of a sudden everybody from Laura Bush to Bill Clinton... Lots of people in between are talking about how this concentration camps at the border are the worst thing that anyone's ever seen in the history of the world. Even though that's been happening for a long time here, especially under the Obama administration, and it happens in virtually every country in the world. Somebody, somebody just flicked the switch and say, okay, let's start talking about how this is the only place in the world this happened and it's worse than the world. Two things that aren't true, but two things that you wouldn't know weren't true because so many people are pretending as if they are. But even before this immigration thing started just a few days ago, a few weeks ago, there were stories, the same story all over the country. Big newspapers, Pulitzer Prize winners. Now it's even it's seeped into college classrooms. People are now the new buzzword is do not white people should not call the police on black people. Now here's where it breaks down a little bit for me because I can't tell whether A, white people shouldn't call police on black people because black people are always innocent of all these crimes white people are saying they're committing even though we've got them on video and audio and witnesses and 911 calls, lots and lots of patterns. Or is it B, which is, well, crime is the new black entitlement if you see a black person catching a crime, well, they're just playing a little bit of catch up for eight million years of white on black oppression and racism. Taki Magazine had a story about this this morning where the writer talked about how in Chicago, white guy shot a black guy in the middle of a car hijacking. The black guy was trying to hijack the, the white guy's car. And I hadn't even heard about this one. And uh, all the guy's friends, the guy who got shot, they turned around and said, why'd you shoot him? Why didn't you just let him go? You have insurance. You could have gotten yourself a new car. Instead, you defended your property against this guy. For what? A car? So that's kind of the new standard, which is don't call the cops, let alone pull guns on them. Even so, you know, maybe there are times when we should call cops. Maybe there are times when we shouldn't. I don't know. That's why I like to play this game now from time to time called call or don't call. I like to run just a series of stories and you can tell me whether the people involved should have called or not. Well, Brandon Arufo says he wants these people off the streets because he doesn't want anything like this to ever happen to anyone else. I mean, I really don't remember much. Brandon Arufo says he's still not thinking clearly. He suffered a concussion during a violent beating and robbery about 2.30 Saturday morning in Deep Ellum. He says he's still in a lot of pain, including headaches, and shows us the staples now in the back of his head. Surveillance cameras from nearby the bomb factory captured the attack. Arufo says he and his friend were walking to their car when two men walked up from behind. As Arufo turned and walked up to them as if to help, he was sucker punched, knocked out cold. The suspect then stole his wallet as the other man began beating his female friend and stealing her purse. The attackers then just casually walked off. Just my wallet. 
my wallet, which is it's kind of funny because I got my my watch on and my my phone. But I mean, you know, everybody's still alive. They're okay, so that's what matters. You want him to turn himself in, though, huh? Um, I, I wouldn't mind it. I'd like some sort of justice. It was very disturbing. The assault itself, and then what was just as disturbing was, you know, obviously we had cars, you know, rolling by, and uh, from what I understand, no one dialed 911. Philip Honore is the public safety manager for the Deep Ellum Foundation and says neighbors need to look out for each other. Honore says he's already shared this video with businesses and residents. They will share that information, and then maybe we can identify um, you know, people that want to do harm to us and keep them out of our neighborhood. As Arufo slowly recovers, he has some strong words for the suspects. I forgive you. I hope that you find whatever in life that, uh, that you're looking for, and may God bless you. And I hope that um, you start living a better way. Detectives here, they're still actively investing this case. So far, no arrest. The victim tells me that she was hit from behind by a group of women, possibly a mother and her daughter involved. I guess this isn't okay. This isn't okay at all. I would never do this to someone. Through tears and pain, Sharon Walker describes what happened to her nearly a week ago as she was taking a walk through her St. Paul neighborhood in the late evening. I'd never seen them before. I never talked to any of them, never said a word prior to being hit. Walker was just three blocks from her home when she was attacked from behind near Sylvan and Atwater Streets, about a mile north of the state capitol. I lost consciousness, and um, I believe at that point I was choked and drug, drug, dragged on the ground. She says the group of women tore her jewelry off and stole her phone. Walker recalls a woman telling her daughter to keep hitting and others just standing by. For people to just sit around and watch it happen or encourage it. I don't know why anyone would encourage that. The 39-year-old somehow stumbled home and her husband called 911. She spent close to five days in the hospital with a severe concussion, memory and vision loss, and other extensive injuries. She's lived in this neighborhood for a few years now and never thought her life would be in danger just going for a walk around the block. I'm just worried on the edge now that and if they don't get caught, I don't know how many other people they do this to. Well, Lucy, anyone who's ever held one of these bottles, you know how thick and heavy they can be. Well, fortunately, this boy only suffered an abrasion, but his family says it could have been much, much worse. This street is not safe, like especially at the nighttime. The father of a 10-year-old boy speaks out after his son was viciously hit in the head with a thick Jack Daniels bottle after it crashed through the side window of a van moving down the 600 block of Lindley Avenue in North Philly. I asked him actually yesterday and asked him about his head because, you know, the kids told the bottle. Thankfully, Hugo says his boy is fine now, but his well-being was uncertain last Thursday night when it all went down. Watch as a boy hurls that bottle right into the passenger side of the van where the 10-year-old boy was sitting. The boys then run away like cowards. That child um, had an abrasion, a significant abrasion on the right side of his head and cuts as a result of the glass shattering. The victim was with his mother on their way to the park but raced to the hospital instead with a bottle and glass all over the inside of the van. What did your wife say? No, she was, you know, very upset. She's, you know, she's crying and all that because my son get her. Here, let's get a better look at the boys police are looking for thanks to a high-quality surveillance camera. Here you see the attacker first picking up the bottle while waiting for someone to pass by. And get this, investigators say one of them threw something else at another car just before this incident took place. We believe that anybody that knows these individuals would be able to identify them, uh, whether they're family members, friends, neighbors. Police believe the boys are from the neighborhood and the victim's dad wants their parents to step up. Especially if the parents saw all this gun, they don't say anything. Because parents don't say anything? They don't say anything to the kids.
and police say the suspect is between 14 and 16 years old. They say he had a picture of a rooster on his T-shirt. Well, that crime spree ended here in this Fisher's neighborhood. Investigators tell me these suspects are linked to dozens of car break-ins in Madison County. A police officer on patrol in this normally quiet Fisher's neighborhood says he spotted five teens dressed entirely in black casing cars near 106th and Hague Road. We're just happy that we were able to catch these five people and, and get them off the, off, off the street before they actually did hurt someone. Police say those teens took off through the Berkeley Grove neighborhood around 5 a.m. on Saturday, but just a few minutes later, Fisher's police arrested Akil Miles, Ertez Johnson, and three juveniles. Investigators tell me inside of the suspect's cars, officers found a gun, drugs, and stolen items that were taken during several car break-ins in both Hamilton County and Madison County. On Father's Day in the middle of the afternoon, one smiling backyard burglar spies the swimming pool. I actually have them notified on my phone, and I saw the uh, whole thing happen on live on my phone. Cameras record the entire kiddie pool caper. Really? Really? This, that, that's all I could think of was just really... Brandon Turner at the zoo with his kids watches as not one, but a pair of predators pull for his pool. You know what, these first two people, the first two crimes we saw there, one in Deep Ellum and one in um, uh, where the woman got assaulted in St. Paul. One of the things these people don't know, they're so eager to forgive their attackers. They are so eager to forgive these groups of black people who beat them to the point of death. Two things I don't know. One, nobody's interested in being forgiven. Nobody's asking for forgiveness. Did you hear anybody ask for forgiveness? They laugh at this forgiveness. Uh, and the second thing they don't know is say they catch the assailants. Here's the way it works. You are the witness. Without you, there are there is no crime. So the, you know the, you, they go through lots of preliminary, lots of preliminary things. The thing keeps getting put on and on and off, off and off and off until finally, two, three, six months later, they have some kind of hearing where you are allowed to show up. You show up. You've taken the day off of work. You've ridden the bus, the trolley, the car. You've parked. You've done this and that. It's an all-day thing. You show up in court. The, ju the, the defense attorney gets up and says, "Oh, Your Honor, we're not ready. We have another six months." Judge says, "Sure, why not?" This goes on three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. It's just a game of chicken. They're just constantly delaying these things until the people who are the witnesses get tired of showing up for court and charges get dropped. That is the game they play. And so it's going to be up to these people involved in this crime and when they stop being so busy about forgiving the black people who tried to kill them are they going to have what it takes to keep showing up in court over and over and over, keep sending the message to the defense judge and prosecutor that we are here for the long haul? We are here. We're not going to give up. We're not going to let these people get away with what they did to us. I loved how in St. Paul they said, well, we've never seen anything like this in St. Paul in this neighborhood before. Good Lord, we've done nothing but document this kind of crap in Minneapolis, St. Paul for a very long time. Many, many, many cases of black or white crime. Everybody in Minneapolis is all caught up in the Minneapolis and Minnesota nice. They don't have any idea what they're in for when they think they can just move into a neighborhood near a bunch of black people. They think they can just go out and take a walk around the neighborhood, say hello to the fellas. Any doubt about that? Look up the word Ray Widstrand and don't make the black kids angry. In the meantime, it's probably good advice for yourself when you're out there and about trying to decide whether to call or not call. Because the overriding principle on all these questions is whether calling or not calling is going to make the black kids angry.